Now that everybody is back from lunch, I figured I'll show you a little movie. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, turn off your cell phones and no snoring, please. Um, the presentation I put together, it's, it's more of a thought-provoking rather than a scientific, even though there are some data in the presentation, I promise I will try to skip through them as quickly as possible. <laughs> Uh, so it's more, again, it's more of a concept that I think is beginning to be, become very popular and I can see a future uh, going into that direction. So let me start with the movie. There are a couple animations in the presentation. Some are useful, some are more entertaining purposes only. So the first movie is actually useful. It's about four and a half minutes long. Okay, now I can figure out how to get to that movie. All right. Why is it not playing? Okay, it's playing. Help the intestinal microflora. 
They can also potentially help prevent or treat Shigella infections or other infections caused by foodborne or waterborne bacterial pathogens. Moreover, phage biotics may help improve human health in areas not involving bacterial diseases. For instance, recent scientific studies have linked specific bacteria with certain disease states such as obesity, irritable bowel disease, autism, and certain forms of cancer. Phage's unique ability to precisely target and eliminate those problematic bacteria may enable us to gently fine-tune the human intestinal microbiota to stave off diseases beyond bacterial infections. Bacteriophages, keeping us safe nature's way. <laughs> I'm very pleased to like the videos and I, sometimes I feel bad that I'm standing here and letting the video do the job, but I did write the script. So, um, now, it is on YouTube, yes, and it's also on our company website, yes. It's, uh, so, if anybody just search for Fauci says probiotics, it will probably come up. So, um, now, okay, am I, am I going in the wrong direction now? All right, so I can easily skip that slide here, as long as you want to look at the character. Um, this is one of the videos that are more entertaining purposes. Um, but you will see some familiar faces here. Uh, actually, my son put it all together, so I felt compelled to show it. But it basically gives you an idea of the relative sizes of different things, including bacteria and bacteriophages. Um, we're almost there. <laughs> and here again the friendly character. So as you may have gathered from the presentation or the video, um, what I'd like to talk about is a, a conceptually novel idea, although some people might argue that the, to use bacteriophages as probiotics. And the purpose here is not to uh, trigger discussions whether I should be saying phage or phage or, and whether or not the viruses are alive or dead. But think about, just look beyond those issues and think about more bigger picture. And, and I think there are some tremendous and exciting opportunities. Uh, clearly a very redundant slide, the phages or phages have been used therapeutically for a very, very, very long time. And some of those applications, uh, particularly prophylactic applications, were very close to what we are considering now as a possibly probiotic or phage biotic approach. I'm not going to read the slide. Now we can spend as much time as you like discussing those studies offline, but let me move forward. Different types of administrations, again, in almost any imaginable route. For probiotic applications, I think the most relevant will be the first oral, although some local applications can, cannot also be ruled out. So, um, as, as you all know, the interest in practical applications is growing. And so when we formed Intralytics back in 1998, uh, we were laughed at. And so, but now there are several companies, there are several regulatory approvals, there are several products on the market, and there are several clinical trials either in process or being uh, prepared. And so clearly it has come a long way around. And and people think about traditional and non-traditional applications, and really when you think about where I could use this, anywhere where bacteria is a problem, you can potentially use it. And there are some settings where it could be more useful than the others, and in some settings you may not be able to use them at all. But this gives you a sort of a broad idea or, or range of possible applications. Now the first, the food safety, is clearly uh, one of the most advanced, again, several uh, well, four or five products already approved on the market, um, but the others are catching up. What I'd like to talk a little more ab about the probiotic product applications. Um, food safety, I'm going to skip sort of slides. The original intention was that it is the first most frequent use. It ties into probiotic applications because you basically apply phages onto foods, you eat those foods, you, this is oral delivery of the phage exactly the same route as you would imagine for 
uh, for probiotic applications. Uh, phages are very common everywhere in, in many, many foods. In fact, probably 100% of untreated foods are carrying uh, a different, uh, different bacteriophages. Again, um, moving forward, this is the first product that was ever approved for food safety applications. Um, some efficacy study, I promised, well, I'll go through the efficacy studies real quick. Uh, it, the technolo technologically, it also has come a long way around. Uh, we are currently producing them in 1,500 liter fermenters that, to my knowledge, is the largest manufacturing capacity in the world today, and we are looking to scale up even further. So, uh, I mean, it, it, it has come a long way since over the last uh, ten, 10 years or so. But let's talk about the probiotics. This is an old article that uh, Maya put together. I, I, I liked it because it was one of the first that started looking at metagenomics and looking for phages in the GI tract. And I think, uh, well, there are more papers since then, and I think we will be seeing more and more as, as uh, time goes by. Uh, there are some interesting numbers there, just gives you an idea of just how many phages are uh, secreted or carried by, by humans. Uh, just an F-specific phage, 10 to the 10 to the 18 PFU shed per day in the United States only. And that's just the F-specific phage. So really, they're everywhere. The GI tract is really loaded <coughs> with them. So what we hope to do is to learn how to use the phages to gently manipulate the GI microflora and help us deal with some infectious and potential non-infectious diseases. Um, so again, a typical introductory talk. Everybody knows GI tract is loaded with bacteria. Certain things that we do messes up the balance, such as antibiotics, certain diets. Uh, and so there are different ways to restore it. And one way that is becoming more and more popular is the probiotic. Um, you know, people increasingly eat yogurt and other healthy foods and juices that contain microorganisms in them to restore their GI uh, balance. Um, so what is the probiotic? Uh, basically, it means pro-life. And the indications are that uh, even Old Testament even says that uh, Abraham's longevity was partially at least attributable to the fact that he was eating sour milk, which presumably had lots of good bacteria. Presumably, again, lactobacilli. Uh, the name itself is an is a interesting topic because there's a constant fighting about the name. It's almost like phage and phage. Uh, the first was in 65 that came closely to what, what was called probiotics at that point. The, the next was from Parker in 74 <coughs> that came as close to the current definition um, as, as you can feel it, just reading, reading slides here. What the, the way WHO defines today is live microorganisms which when administered in adequate uh, amounts confer a health benefit to the host. Uh, it's, it's very similar to what NIH calls um, probiotics. They actually also save Lyme microorganisms and then in most cases bacteria and that's interesting because uh, with that definition, as long as you're willing to accept that the phages are alive, then there is no reason to not to consider them uh, uh, probiotics. Again, the, the whole purpose is not to argue whether they're alive or not. And what we call them at the end of the day is not that critical really, although there are some regulatory and marketing implications. But the whole idea is to think about a little differently as a concept of using them as probiotics to consume them regularly to help us condition GI microflora. So as the video explained, the whole difference is it's fairly simple. Uh, on the most simplistic term, you eat good bacteria, you eat probiotics, traditional probiotics. Uh, so that they populate your GI tract so it makes it more difficult for bad bacteria to colonize. And again, this is a very simplistic explanation. But the, in the same concept, what bacteriophages will do is specifically go after the targeted bacteria without disturbing anything else. So the end result, uh, as far as the targeted bacterium is concerned, may be the same. Um, and so it's just the mechanism is, is slightly different. Uh, obviously, needless to say, because um, the, the, the probiotic bacteria are typically different for what you're targeting. You can <coughs> usually very, very simply have combinational product that has traditional probiotics and bacteriophage in it. Um, there are some claims. Um, it's, again, it gets into regulatory and 
um, and marketing issues. Uh, the bottom line is that, that um, it, the, it's very tricky to make claims with probiotics. So for example, if I call Fudge a probiotic, I can approve it today. And there are different mechanisms to do this. A dietary ingredient, for example, would be one. Um, but then what I can claim it can do, it, it's, it gets finicky. Um, anytime I make a claim that it can help prevent illness, I may end up in a trouble unless I go the other route and have um, you know, clinical trial data supporting that um, such application indeed is happening. Um, I'm, I have several slides here that I'm going to go quickly through, basically showing that how uh, the university, PIP folks at the University of Florida are doing this, they're actually feeding mice with bacteriophages, looking, comparing the impact with ampicillin and phage, and finding that actually phage, at least numerically, works better than ampicillin. Ampicillin is the one that what you get prescribed if you have shigellosis. And so it actually works just as good, if not better, uh, and it uh, has no side effects, uh, either during short-term administration or long-term, and has no impact on the GI microflora. And I mentioned earlier Maya's paper, and I think this is just the beginning of the study, and we will have much more comprehensive metagenomic analysis on the general GI microflora in response to treatment with antibiotic and treatment with FOSH. And what we expect to see is obviously less disturbances in the phage treated group and more in antibiotic uh, treated group. Um, so moving forward, um, so again, getting back to the concept that we think this is, uh, you can question novel, but at least this type of a thinking is novel, that are they really probiotic? And they could be a ways to fine tuning, uh, to fine tune gut microflora. It's a little different from thinking when you are treating a disease, that a classical phage therapy application. This is doing prophylactically so you can manipulate GI microflora. In some cases, you're not even talking about infectious diseases. Uh, they have um, uh, infectious, obviously, it's very simple. If it's a bacterial infection, you treat bacteria, you go after bacterial infection. The, what, is, what, what is making this even more exciting is that there is an increasing body of data now that says there are lots of other non-infectious diseases that are associated with a specific composition of GI, uh, GI tract. And so uh, cancer, some, of, some forms of obesity, and, and so on. So if that really turns out to be true, and some of them are beginning to look real, and if you can make that connection, then really phages give you the only tool that we have today, there's nothing like it, that you can go and manipulate GI microflora. And, and if that all comes together, the opportunities are just tremendous. So, so this is really making me very, very exciting. And again, I fully anticipate more research going into that direction, both for the GI microflora study as well as the role of phage uh, on that microflora. Uh, last item here is the flexibility to update the cocktails. There were some discussions earlier today that uh, I think the only right approach going to regulators is to ask for a flexibility to update the cocktails. And I think that's an absolutely correct approach. And um, uh, this is not related to uh, probiotics, but that's a study that was just published in Journal of Bacteriophage. Gives you an, a concept. So you have a, it's basically on salmonella phages. So you have a cocktail of bacteriophages. Let's say you can put six together. And they, if they kill the strain in vitro, then they can kill the strain either in vivo or in some efficacy testing study. But if they don't kill that strain, you can always substitute the cocktail, make a different one that has factors that kill that resistance strain, and you're back in business. You, you restore the efficacy. So it's really important for long-term efficacy. Uh, the only thing really that gives you the flexibility to keep up with uh, bacterial resistance, uh, and when I say bacterial resistance, not necessarily because we've been using phages and resistance emerged, but even if we don't use phages, bacteria evolve, and there are some clones that come up there that will be resistant eventually. So this, this has some interesting implications there. And getting to the last slide of the presentation, just I borrowed it from uh, another publication just to show you how complex the microbiome is. We're not only talking about GI microflora. There are, uh, the complex microflora everywhere involved in all aspects of our life, infectious diseases um, or none. And so this 
platform technology can potentially be used in, in, in all of those applications. Uh, uh, and so really, again, at the risk of repeating myself, I think the opportunities are really mind-boggling here. So I hope to see more and more people, including people in this room, taking a closer look at this and see where can this all go. Uh, I think I stop my presentation at this point. Um, just as a final word, I think Betty made an announcement yesterday about the journal Bacteriophage. Um, we would love to see submissions, as she outlined in her um, announcement yesterday. Uh, if there are any questions that you would like to discuss, uh, about 40% of editorial board is here at that meeting. Uh, I'm here all day today, so if anybody has any questions, by all means. Uh, I think I'll stop at this point. Thank you very much. Uh, we can take a couple of questions while our next speaker gets set up. Um, my first question actually is whether your animator has any plans to start working for giant microbes. Because his faces are a lot better than the ones that are currently Excellent. on the little, the little yeah. stuffed bugs. Uh, do you have any questions for Sandro? Yeah, Martha. Hello. Yes, I was just wondering if you're planning to, or to, to look at these um, pathogenic archaea that are sometimes associated with different gut conditions. The, well, um, if you to put the archaeal viruses into these. Not in the immediate <laughs> future. No. Do Hi. Um, Hi. The studies you were talking to linking um, the gut flora with obesity, mm -hmm. autism, etc. Um, I mean, the studies that I've seen really are about biodiversity. And so lack of biodiversity leads to these conditions. And you're eliminating, so you're reducing biodiversity? So uh, it's, I wish it was that simple. It's not that simple. It's, uh, there are some diseases that, uh, and, and it's again, I don't know, 50% versus 50, 60, 50, 40. People would say that if you have more of these bacteria, then it's bad. People will say if, if you have more of this bacteria, then it's a good thing. So clearly, where this will come into play, where th reducing the number is a good thing. And so uh, until we have a clear correlation, I think I mentioned that during the talk, between the bacterial composition and the disease, uh, <coughs> it will be hard to use it. So unless you really know that this is the bacterium that if I get rid of or reduce numbers that it will have a physiological impact or clinical impact, this is probably not useful. All I'm saying that there are increasingly links like that being looked at. And so if there is a, if the large number is good, clearly this is of no use for that type of clinical application. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think you can add bacteria and take away the good, the bad ones with the virus. Mm -hmm. But calling it a probiotic is the opposite of what it is. Oh, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, thank you. Oh, Betty? Uh, Betty? One comment still. Um, I mentioned earlier that um, here in Washington and Oregon, naturopathic physicians are permitted to use natural products that are widely made, used and approved in other parts of the world. And we have here with us today the two naturopaths who have been using intestinophage, particularly uh, various gut things. And if there's a little bit of time at the end of today's session, let me please introduce Satya and Satya Ambrose from Portland and Raman Moore. Um, they've been doing a lot of kinds of things for a long time. Satya was my student in 73. Um, and uh, it's not it's at the point where they're doing case studies and, and, and not yet ready to write up, so we haven't scheduled it. But I'll mention briefly a few individual cases of kinds of unexpected things, where, which seem to be much more by the rebalancing using these, and some of them in other ways. Mm -hmm. I, I know a little bit about that type of use, and I'd love to hear more. So by all means, if we can talk a little more afterwards, that would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll, Yes. <laughs> um. <laughs>